So just one more time, if you're coming in, just tell us what you're reading and what format in the chat. Questions go in Q and A. And at the end, there will be a survey for those who attended live to tell us what their favorite books are, what they're looking forward to reading. It'll be on a slide towards the end, but also as you exit Zoom, it will be popping up as a survey. Way. So we're excited about that. Austin, anybody else, anything else I need to tell anybody or have I got it covered? Not that I can think of. It sounds like everything, everything's all set. Yeah, we can start whenever you're ready. Still have people, a few stragglers coming in, but I think we're ready to start. So welcome to Bookachino Live for March. We were saying that we remember we changed the clocks this weekend. So remember, you've got to change your clock back, which means I will feel like I'm in Chicago and jet lagged all next week. So we are going to present books that are coming out as usual in the next four weeks, and we will be teasing some books that are coming out in May. So let's get started. First off, as we go forward, hmm, Austin, of course, now I can't move this. Okay. We have your top picks from February. These are the books that you said to us when you filled out the survey you were most interested in reading. First is The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post by Alison Pataki. Second is The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. Next is The Tobacco Wives, which is by Adele, just one second, I've got to move something, Myers. And then we've got The Other Family by Wendy Corsi Staub and One Italian Summer by Rebecca Searle. So we've got five books. Those were the ones that were your top picks. And we always love seeing what you're most interested in reading. Next up, we're gonna get right into going into fiction. Give me one second. Just one second. Ugh, does this all the time. Oh, dear. Maybe try clicking your screen. That's what I am doing. Yes, clicking screen. There we go, fiction. Okay. And from fiction, we're going into The Summer Getaway by Susan Mallory. Now, anybody who's in the Northeast right now where it's been snowing today, doesn't that cover just look beautiful? Isn't that what we're looking forward to? This is coming out on March 15th. And in the story, single mom Robin Caldwell needs a new plan for her future. She's always put her family first. And now with her kids grown, she yearns for change. But what can she do when her daughter has become the most demanding bride ever? Her son won't even consider college. Her best friend is on the brink of marital disaster and his ex is making a mon monumentally bad decision that could ruin everything. Well, she'll take a vacation, of course. So when her great aunt Lillian invites her to go to Santa Barbara for the summer, Robin hops on the first plane to sunny California. But it's hard to get away when you're at the heart of the family. One by one, everyone she loves follows her across the country. Somehow their baggage doesn't feel as heavy in the sun-drenched mishmash mansion. And the more time that Robin spends with a free spirit Lillian, the more possibilities she sees for dreams, love, and family. Don't we all know like when you just get away, which we haven't been able to do much in the last two years, everything that you're thinking about just kind of fades away. Next, we've got French Braid by Ann Tyler, which is coming on March 22nd. Here we've got the Garretts take their first and last family vacation in the summer of 1959. They hardly ever leave home, but in some ways they've never been further apart. Mercy has trouble resisting the siren call of her aspirations to be a painter, which means less time keeping house for her husband, Robin. Their teenage daughters, Steady Alice and Boy Crazy Lily could not have less in common. Their youngest, David, is already intent on escaping his family's orbit for reasons none of them understand. Yet as these lives advance across decades, the Garrett's influences on one another ripple ineffably, but unmistakably through each generation. I love this uh, cover, first of all, because it's turquoise, yes, favorite color, but also the way the braid, um, the braided rug or the braided tapestry behind there. And for those um, of you um, do not remember who is Ann Tyler, she is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of A Spool of Blue Thread. Next, we've got The Wedding Veil by Christy Woodson Harvey. Um, you may recognize her name because she's one of the four authors that does the Friends in Fiction show every week on Facebook. Um, they do it on Wednesdays at seven o'clock. If you haven't checked it out, it's a lot of fun. So it's coming on March 29th. And here we've got four women, one family heirloom, a secret connection that will change their lives and history as they know it. So in the present day, Julie Baxter's wedding veil bequeathed to her great grandmother by a mysterious woman on a train in the 1930s has passed through generations of her family as a symbol of a happy marriage. But Julia is conflicted about this and heads out of town. 
Meanwhile, her grandmother Babs is still grieving the death of her beloved husband when she decides to move into a retirement community and runs into an old flame. Now it's flipped to 1914. Let's go back in time. Socialite Edith Vanderbilt is struggling to manage the luxurious Biltmore estate after the untimely death of her cherished husband. Edith must prepare her free-spirited daughter Cornelia to inherit it to save their family's deteriorating uh, financial situation. But Cornelia has dreams of her own. As she explores more of the rapidly changing world around her, Cornelia is torn between upholding tradition and pursuing the exciting future that lies beyond Biltmore's gilded gates. If any of you had time to spend time in the, uh, the uh, Biltmore mansion, it's just an incredible place. It is just absolutely stunningly beautiful. And as you walk through the rooms, you see history coming to life and you feel like, oh, this is 1914. This is exactly how this place felt. It's really incredibly fun. Next, we've got The Candy House. And I just love the cover on this with all those beautiful colors by Jennifer Egan. And you probably know her as the Pulitzer Prize winning author of A Visit from the Goon Squad. So this is coming on April 5th. Candy House opens with a staggeringly brilliant Bix B B Boughton, whose company Mandala is so successful that he is, quote, one of the tech demigods with whom we're all on a first name basis. Bix is 40 with four kids, restless, desperate for a new idea. When he stumbles into a conversation group, mostly Columbia professors, one of whom is experimenting with downloading or externalizing memory. So now it's 1910 and within a decade, Bix's new technology, Own Your Own Unconscious, which allows you to access every memory you've ever had and to share every memory in exchange for access to the memories of others has seduced multitudes, but not everyone. In spellbinding interlocking narratives, Jennifer Egan spins out the consequences of Own Your, Own, Own Your Unconscious through the lives of multiple characters whose paths intersect over several decades. That's a pretty huge concept from a guy who was like one of those one one word names like, uh, you know, Jeff and, you know, Steve and all the other names that we've known. So Bix, uh, kind of an interesting idea. Not so sure I'm interested. I'd love to know what you guys think. Next, we've got The Lifeguards by Amanda Air Ward, and she is the author of The Jet Setters, a book I absolutely loved. It was a bets on selection when it came out a couple of years ago. This book's coming on April 5th. Austin's Zilker Park neighborhood is a wonderland of green belt trails, live music, and moms who drink a few too many margaritas. Whitney, Annette, and Liza have grown thick as thieves as they raised their children together for 15 years, believing they can shelter them from an increasingly dangerous world. Their friendship is unbreakable, as safe as the neighborhood where they've raised their sweet little boys, or so they think. One night, the three women have been enjoying happy hour when their boys, lifeguards for the summer, come back on bicycles for a late night dip in their fame, favorite uh, swimming hole. The boys share a secret, news that will shatter the perfect world their mothers have so painstakingly created. There we've got the lifeguards. And you know, there is always that thing. There's always this time where you've had your kids and your kids have been really sheltered for a really long time and then they go off on their own and kind of the world changes a lot. So obviously these women are gonna be taken for a total, they might need a lot more margaritas after this. Next, we've got the Master Craftsman by uh, Kelly Stewart, which is gonna be one of our spring preview giveaway titles. You know what those are, the contests that go up for just 24 hours. You gotta keep your eye out for them. If you sign up for the spring preview emails, you get those in the mail and you know you have just 24 hours to enter the contest. So let's talk about this book that's coming April 5th. In 1917, Alma um, Pihi, a uh, master craftsman in the House of Fabergé was charged to protect one of the greatest secrets in Russian history, an unknown Fabergé egg that Peter Carl Fabergé secretly created to honor his divided allegiance to both the people of Russia and the imperial czar's family. When Alma and her husband escaped Russia from their native Finland in 1921, she took the secret with her, guarding her past connection to the Romanov family. Three generations later, world-renowned treasure hunter Nick Lane is sick and fears the secret of the missing egg will die with him. With time running out, he entrusts the mission of retrieving the egg to his estranged daughter, Ava, who has little idea of the danger she is about to face. As the stakes are raised, Ava is forced to declare her own allegiance, and the consequences are greater than she ever could have imagined. So there's the master craftsman. 
Next, we've got Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow, also coming on April 5th. Summer 1995, 10-year-old Joan, her mother and her younger sister flee her father's explosive temper and seek refuge at her mother's ancestral home in Memphis. This is not the first time violence has altered the course of the family's trajectory. Half a century earlier, Joan's grandfather built this majestic house in the historic black neighborhood of Douglas, only to be lynched days after becoming the first black, is becoming the first black detective in the city. Joan tries to settle into her new life, but family secrets cast a longer shadow than any of them expected. She grows up, Joan finds relief in her artwork, painting portraits of the community in Memphis. One of her subjects is the enigmatic neighbor, Miss Dawn, who claims to know something about curses and whose stories about the past help Joan see how her passion, imagination, and relentless hope are in fact the continuation of a long matrilineal tradition. Here we've got Memphis. It's another really wonderful cover. I have to admit, I'm always like really transfixed by covers and how they are all so different and how they can evoke so much about the book. I am absolutely love the, the, these moments of looking at the covers. Next, we've got Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. And you know her as the best-selling author of The Glass Hotel and Station Eleven. It's coming on April 5th. Edwin St. Andrew is 18 years old when he crosses the Atlantic by steamship, exiled from polite society following an ill-conceived diatribe at a dinner party. He enters the Canadian wilderness and suddenly hears the notes of a violin echoing in an airship terminal, an experience that shocks him to his core. Two centuries later, a famous writer named Olive Llewellyn is on a book tour. She's traveling all over Earth, but her home is the second moon colony, a place of artificial beauty. Within the text of Olive's best-selling pandemic novel lies a strange passage. A man places violin for change in the echoing corridor of an airship terminal as the trees of a forest rise around him. When Gaspary Jacques Roberts, a de detective in the Black Sky Night City, is hired to investigate an anomaly in the North American wilderness, he uncovers a series of lives upended. And there we have Sea of Tranquility. That's really funny. I was just in an author event and they were talking about going on tour. And I'm like, wow, now we might have to go outside the galaxy to be going on book tour. So the second moon colony is where some of these people may end up. They should only live so long. Next, we're going to do historical fiction. We know it's a favorite category for so many of our readers. And we're going to begin with Booth by Karen Joy Fowler, which is on sale this week. In 1882, a secret family moves into a secret cabin some 30 miles northeast of Baltimore to farm, to hide, and to bear 10 children over the course of the next 16 years. Junius Booth, breadwinner, celebrated Shakespearean actor, and master of the house in more ways than one, is at once a mesmerizing talent and a man of terrifying instability. One by one, the children arrive as year by year, the country draws frighteningly closer to the boiling point of secession and civil war. As the tenor of the world shifts, the booths emerge from their hidden lives to cement their place as one of the country's leading theatrical families. But behind the curtains of the many stages they have graced, multiple scandals, family triumphs, and criminal disasters begin to take their toll. And the solemn siblings of giant John Wilkes Booth are left to reckon with the truth behind the destructively spe specious promise of an early prophecy. So there you've got Booth by Joy, Karen Joy Fowler. Next, we've got Peach Blossom Spring by Melissa Fu, which is coming on March 15th. It's 1938 in China, and as a young wife, Melon's future is bright. But with the Japanese army approaching, Melin and her four-year-old son, Renshu, are forced to flee their home, relying on little but their wits and a beautifully illustrated hand scroll filled with ancient fables that offer solace and wisdom. They must travel through a ravaged country seeking refuge. Years later, Renshu has set settled in America as Henry Dow. Through his daughter, though his daughter is desperate to understand her heritage, he refuses to talk about his childhood. How can he keep his family safe in this new land when the weight of his history threatens to drag them down? Yet how can Lily learn who she is if she can never know her family's story? It's got Peach Bottoms in Spring. It's out on uh, March 15th. 
Um, when I was reading the description of this, I was thinking of a Lisa C book. So I'm gonna have to check this out and see if there are similarities. Next, we've got The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn coming on March 29th. It's a big book for um, Kate. This is gonna be her first hardcover book. And many of you know her as the author of The Rose Code. So in the snowbound city of Kiev, hmm, Ryan books, uh, bookish history student, Mila Pavlichenko organizes her life around her library job and her young son. But Hitler's invasion of Russia sends her on a different path. Given a, a rifle and set to join the fight, Mila must forge herself from studious girl to deadly sniper, a lethal hunter of Nazis known as Lady Death. When news of her 300th kill makes her a national heroine, Mila finds herself torn from the bloody battlefields of the Eastern Front and sent to America on a goodwill tour. Still reeling from war wounds and devastated by loss, she finds herself isolated and lonely in the glittering world of New York of Washington, DC, until an unexpected friendship with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and an even more unexpected connection with a silent fellow sniper after the offer the possibility of happiness. But when an old enemy from Mila's past joins forces with a deadly new foe lurking in the shadows, Lady Death finds herself battling her own demons and en enemy bullets in the deadliest duel of her life. So there we've got The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. Very, very, very highly anticipated book. Next, we've got Four Treasures of the Sky by Jenny Tengu Han Zhang coming on April 5th. Dayu never wanted to be like the tragic heroine for which she is named, revered for her beauty and cursed with heartbreak. But when she is kidnapped and smuggled across the ocean from China to America, Dayu must relinquish home and future she imagined for herself. Over the years that follow, she's forced to keep reinventing herself to survive, from a calligraphy school to a San Francisco brothel to a shop tucked into the Idaho mountains, we follow Dayu in a desperate quest to outrun the tragedy that chases her. As anti-China sentiment sweeps across the country in a wave of unimaginable violence, Dayu must join on each of these selves she has become, including the one she most wants to leave behind, in order to finally claim her own name and story. Four Treasures of the Sky. Next, we've got Sister Stardust by Jane Green, which is coming on April 5th. And I was just at an American Booksellers Association event and got to talk to Jane. And we're going to set up an interview to talk to her about Sister Stardust. And it was very nice to be able to reconnect with her. So we've got the story. And it's very interesting because the story is going to resonate with so many different generations of people. From afar, Talitha's life seemed perfect. In her 20s and already a famous model and actress, she moved from London to a palace in Marrakesh with her husband, Paul Getty, famous, famous oil hair. There she presided over a swir swirling expat scene filled with music, art, free love, and a counterculture taking root around the world. When Claire arrives in London from her small town, she never expects to cross paths with a woman as magnetic as Talitha Getty. Yearning for the adventures and its independence, she swept off to Marrakesh, where the two become kindred spirits. But beneath Talitha's glamorous facade works a darkness few can understand. As their friendship blossoms and the two grow closer, the realities of Talitha's precarious existence set off a chain of dangerous events that could alter Claire's life forever. This is going to be a book that's really got you swept up into what was happening in the 60s. Let me see if I can read this Laura Dave quote here. Sister Stardust is a wonderful and big hearted and fancy and expansive and page turning. It's a joy to read. And Laura, as you know, is the best selling author of The Last Thing He Told Me. Next, we've got Thrillers and Mysteries. We're going to start with Double Blind, a Georgia Davis novel of suspense from Libby Fisher Hellman. It's on sale this week. With little work um, during the pandemic, Chicago PI Georgia Davis agrees to help the best friend of a fellow sleuth, El Ellie uh, Foreman. Susan Slyler's um, aunt died suddenly after a COVID booster, and Susan's distraught mother wants that death investigated. However, Georgia's investigation is interrupted by a family trip to Nauvoo, uh, Nauvoo, Nauvoo Illinois, the one-time uh, Mormon heartland. It's there that her life unexpectedly intersects with the runaway spouse of a Mormon fundamentalist. Back in Evanston, after Georgia is almost killed by a hit and run driver, she discovered that she and the escaped woman look remarkably alike. Someone trying to kill Georgia because of her death investigation 
Or is it the case of mistaken identity? And how can she find her doppelganger before whoever wants them both dead tries again? So there you go, double blind. Next, we've got The Golden Couple by Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. I read this book last weekend and I found on Greer's um, Instagrams an interesting answer to a question that I had. Two of them used to wake up in the morning, say hello to each other online, and then type together by going back and forth, talking about plots and everything, um, writing and shared Google Docs. And when I was trying to figure out what happened to them the last couple of years when the pandemic came around, I knew they had young children, what happened? And sure enough, Greer says, we had a pullback from the way we usually wrote, wrote and wrote on our own because somebody would be coming in asking for lunch or somebody would be in asking for help with homework. So it changed their entire writing style when they worked together on The Golden Couple. So what do we have here? So there's wealthy Washington suburbanites, Marissa and Matthew Bishop seem to have it all until Marissa's unfaithful. Beneath their veneer of perfection is a relationship driven by work and a lack of intimacy. She wants to repair things for the sake of their eight-year-old son because she loves her husband. Enter Avery Chambers. Avery is a therapist who lost a professional license. Still, it doesn't stop her from counseling those in crisis, though they have to adhere to her unorthodox methods. And the bishops are desperate. When they glide through Avery's door and Marissa reveals her infidelity, all three are set on a collision course. But the biggest secrets in the room are still hidden and it's no longer simply a marriage that's in danger. And what happens is there are different, I think there are eight or nine different way, um, different chapters that um, uh, Avery, meeting Avery wants to have with her clients, each one a specific thing. And this is what's gonna happen at this meeting. And you're going to go out to dinner together and you need to talk about X. And she gives them all kinds of assignments to do along the way. And then things sort of started to get flipped as the story becomes what are we really, really talking about here? So it's very well done. It's um, the golden couple. Next, we've got Brad Meltzer's The Lightning Rod, a Zig and Nola novel. And there's something that's really uh, fun about this. Uh, Brad, now this is his 25th year of writing. And that means that Brad started writing about the same time uh, Book Reporter started. And he actually dropped me a note last year that said something about you were there right from the beginning. And it was right because we'd reviewed one of his very first novels, his very first novel. And it was kind of fun to see that he remembered that, you know, from through the years. So what have we got going on in the second book in the series? Archie Mint has lent a charmed life. When he's killed trying to stop a robbery in his own home, his family is shattered and then shocked when the other shoe drops. Mint has been hiding criminal secrets none of them could have imagined. Working on Mint's body before his funeral, mortician Zig, Zig, Zigorowski discovers something that he was never meant to see. That telltale in detail leads him to Mint's former top secret military unit and his connection to artist Noah Brown. Two years ago, Noah served, saved Zig's life, so he knows better than most that she's volatile and dangerous. Following Noah's trail, he uncovers one of the U.S. government's most intensely guarded secrets, an undisclosed uh, military facility that dates back to the Cold War and holds the key to something more sinister, a hidden group willing to compromise the very safety and security of America itself. There we've got the lightning rod. And Lee Child calls this a terrific, compelling, unputdownable thriller. And that is usually the way Brad writes. Next, we've got My Darling Husband by Kimberly Bell. This is a book we've spoken about before. It was in our, um, in case you missed this, and the new book coming out feature. And um, this is finally out in paperback. I think we told you that in late December, it was available in both ebook and audio, but now finally available in paperback. And I am going to be interviewing Kimberly next week. So Jade and Cam Lasky are by all accounts, a happily married couple with two adorable kids, a spacious home and a rapidly growing restaurant business. But their world is tipped upside down when Jade is confronted by a masked home invader. As Cam scrambles to gather the ransom money, Jade starts to wonder if they're as financially secure as their lifestyle suggests and whether her husband, uh, other secrets her husband is keeping from her. Cam may be a good father, a celebrity chef and a darling husband, there's another side he's kept hidden from Jade that's put their family in danger. Unbeknownst to Cam and Jade, the home invader has been watching them and is about to turn their family's secrets into a public scandal. I read this, it was a really brisk book. And once again, it's like these happily married couples, but it's not happy on the other side. 
See, story of life, everybody. So there you go. Um, she's the um, best-selling author of The Marriage Lie and Dear Wife. Looking forward to talking to her next week. Now we've got Run, Rose, Run by Dolly Parton and James Patterson. Yes, his new co-author is Dolly Parton. It's on sale this week from Little Brown. Here's the description we've got. Every song tells a story. She's a star on the rise, singing about the hard life behind her. She's also on the run, find a future, lose a past. Nashville is where she's come to claim her destiny. It's also where the darkness she fled might find her and destroy her. This rose red run, 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 rose run. Um, what's really interesting too, is I'm sure that most of you know that Dolly Parton is a huge lover of um, books and literature. And she is very committed to children's literature. She has a foundation and she gives books away to young children in, um, in impoverished areas to make sure that they have reading materials from the time that they're very young. Big, big passion of hers. Uh, there is also gonna be an album of 12 original Dolly Parton songs from the novel. So there you go. Now we've got books that become albums. We're taking a full circle for you folks. Next, we've got The Match by Harlan Coben, which is coming on March 15th. Um, Harlan posted a picture of himself actually in the office the other day, signing copies of the book, something that hasn't happened in two years. So here we go. After months away, Wilde has returned to the Ramapo Mountains in the wake of a failed bid of, at, domest at domesticity that confirms what he's known all along. He belongs on his own, free from the comforts and constraints of modern life. Suddenly, a DNA match on an online ancestry data space finally gives Wilde the opportunity he needs to track down his father. But meeting the man brings up more questions than answers. Wilde is, uh, reaches out to his last, most desperate lead, a second cousin who disappears as quickly as he resurfaces, having experienced an epic fall from grace that can only just be described as a waking nightmare. Was his cousin's downfall a long time coming? Or was he the victim of a conspiracy as cunning as it is complex? And how does it all connect to the man once known as the stranger, a treacherous fugitive with a growing following whose mission and methods have only turned more dangerous with time? Then we've got the match. Next, we've got Her Last Affair by John Searles. I am reading this right now. Um, little backstory on John. John and I um, worked very in offices that are very close to each other. He used to work at Cosmopolitan Magazine in the Hearst Tower. Our office was about a block away. We used to sit and dish gossip on the street when we ran into each other all the time. He's very excited that we're taking the gossip online in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to interview him about this book. So what's going on here? We've got three different storylines going on. Skyla lives alone in the shadow of a defunct drive-in movie theater that she and her husband ran for nearly 50 years. Ever since Hollis's death in a freak accident the year before, Skyla spends her nights ruminating about the regrets and deceptions in her long marriage. That is until she rents a cottage on the property to a charming British man, Teddy Cornwell. A thousand miles away, Linnell is about to turn 50. Bored by her spouse and fired from her job when a questionable photo from her youth surfaces on social media, her only source of joy is an online affair with her first love a man she hasn't seen in nearly 30 years, Teddy Cornwell. While in New York City, Jeremy, a fared, failed and bitter writer, accepts an assignment to review a new restaurant in Providence. Years ago, Providence was the site of his first great love and first great heartbreak. And maybe, just maybe, he'll look her up when he's back in town. So here we've got the definite little tendrils going back and forth for her last affair. Next, we've got The Recovery Agent by Janet Ivanovich. This is a new series for Janet, something completely different that she's going to be doing. Um, also interesting, I'm going to try and drop, in, um, if we're, we can do this in the newsletter, March 31st, I'm going to be interviewing Nelson DeMille and Janet Ivanovich for a special event that Simon & Schuster is doing. And if we can open it to the public, we absolutely will conclude that, um, uh, that link in the, in the uh, newsletter. And this is on sale on March 22nd. As a recovery agent, Gabriella Rose is hired by individuals and companies seeking lost treasures, stolen heirlooms, or missing assets of any kind. She's reliable, cool under pressure, and well-trained in weapons of all types. But Bri Gabriella's latest job isn't for some bamboozled millionaire. It's for her own family, whose home is going to be wiped off a map if they don't come up with a lot of money fast. Inspired by an old family legend, Gabriella sets off for the jungles of Peru in pursuit of the Ring of Solomon and the lost treasure of Lima. 
in this particular job comes with it a huge problem attached, Gabriella's ex-husband, Rafer. It's Rafer who has the map that possibly points to the treasure, and he's not about to let Gabriella find it without him. So we not only have a new story from her, but we actually have somebody leaving the country, going on a trip. We must all follow this person. So there you go, the recovery agent, Jan Ivanovich. Next, we've got the latest Maisie Dobbs book from Jacqueline Winspear. It's called The Sunlit Weapon. It's coming on March 22nd. It's October 1942. Joe Hardy, 22-year-old ferry pilot, is delivering a supermarine Spitfire, the fastest fighter aircraft in the world, to Biggin Hill Aerodrome when she realizes someone is shooting at her aircraft from the ground. She finds an American serviceman in a barn, bound and gagged. It's later revealed that the man is considered a suspect in the disappearance of a fellow soldier who is missing. Two days later, another ferry, pli ferry pilot crashes into the same area where Joe's plan plane was attacked. At the suggestion of one of her colleagues, Joe seeks the help of a, a psychologist and uh, investigator Maisie Dobbs. Meanwhile, Maisie's husband is overseeing security for the First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, during her visit to Britain. There's clearly evidence that German agents have been circling her. Ms. Roosevelt is clearly in danger, and there may well be a direct connection to the death of the women fr woman uh, ferry pilot and the recent activities of two American servicemen. You know, there are times when I'm doing this, this presentation that I want to sit there and say, and at the end, how many times did you hear these words? And it could be something like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, or it could be like uh, a novel that you, you, know, you have to sit and read or something like that. Just come up with like what phrases or what words come up just to see if you're paying attention. Remember when they used to do that in school? We're gonna go back and see if you remember these words. I think we're gonna play that game one month. Next, we've got The Long Weekend by Gillian McMillan. Darkfell Barn is the perfect, a perfectly isolated retreat. Or so says its website when Jane books a reservation for her friends. A quiet place, far removed from the rest of the world, is exactly what they need. The women arrive for a girls' night ahead of their husbands. But what they hope will be a relaxing break soon turns to, hor to horror. Upon arrival at Darkfell Barn, the women find a devastating note claiming one of their husbands will be murdered. There are no phones, no cell service to check on their men, Friendships fracture as the situation spins, spins wildly out of control. Betrayal can come in many forms. What I really like about this is that, once again, we've got one of those locked mysteries. The women are here. The men are on their way. Who's going to save two and how is it going to happen? And Shira Pena blurbs this one and says, fast paced and incredibly compelling. This book will not let you put it down. And I remember Gilly's last book was the same way as well. So looking forward to this. Next, we've got The Missing Piece by John Lesquois, and that is coming on March 29th. No one mourned when San Francisco DA Wes Farrell put Paul Riley in prison 11 years ago for the rape and murder of his girlfriend. And no one is particularly happy to see him again when he's released after uncovered evidence pinned the crime on someone else. In fact, Riley soon turns up murdered, surrounded by the loot from his latest scam. But if Riley was really innocent all along, who wanted him dead? To the cops, it's straightforward. The still grieving father of Riley's dead girlfriend killed former uh, prisoner Farrell, now out of politics and practicing law with master attorney Dismiss Hardy, agrees to represent the defendant, Doug Rush, and is left in the dust when Rush suddenly vanishes. At a loss, Farrell and Hardy ask PT Abe uh, Glitzky to track down the potentially lethal defendant. That's where we've got the missing piece. Now we've got The Shop on Royal Street by Karen White. And anyone who listened to the interview that I did with Karen recently, she talks about starting this new series, which is set in, um, Louis in New Orleans, and why she set it there and why she's so excited about this. And people know that um, Karen wrote a series for years that was set in um, the Trad Street series that was set in Charleston. And that was a place that had a lot of atmosphere. And this has a lot of atmosphere as well. And what also allows Karen to go back to a place where she actually went to college in um, New Orleans. So her Tulane years are going to come back because she's able to go down there and do lots of sightseeing, see what's changed, see what's the same. And a lot has changed, she said, like a lot of the cool places to go before are not the places you go now. They're different places. And she's going to be weaving that into her writing as well. It's on sale on March 29th. 
after a difficult detour on a road to adulthood, Noah Trenholm is looking to begin anew in New Orleans. And what better way to start a future than with her first house? But with the historic fixer upper she buys come with even more work than she anticipated when the house's previous occupants don't seem ready to depart. And you can't communicate with ghosts like her stepmother can. Luckily, Nola knows uh, someone in New Orleans who is able to, even if he's the last person on earth that she wants anything ever to do with again. Bo Ryan comes, comes with his own dark past a past that involves the disappearance of his sister and parents during Hurricane Katrina, and he's connected to the unsolved murder of a woman who once lived in the Creole cottage Nola's determined to make her own, whether the resident's less, uh, restless spirits agree or not. And Karen always weaves into these ghosts into her books and, and, and in her backstories, and a lot of the setup for this book actually came in the last Trad Street book. And it's funny because I am not somebody who usually likes ghosts or people that are of you know fantasy kind of thing like that that's that's written into a novel but these are just stories of great people fun people to read, read about and fun locations and a list like little get in, in, into um into people's slice of life so i'm really looking forward to see what she does with this new series next we've got what happened to the bennett's by lisa scottelini and those who read the newsletter a couple of weeks ago know how crazy i am about this book which is coming out on march 29th and I'm crazy about it because I have never seen Lisa write such a brisk a book. This book is action packed. It's like boom, boom, boom. You know, like when you're watching like a Netflix movie, everything happens really quickly. That is exactly what's happening to the Bennett's here. So by page nine, something's happened. By 20, page 25, something else has happened. And all of a sudden you look up and go, I'm only on page 25. Where is this book going from here? So what do we've got? We've got Jason Bennett, a suburban dad who owns a court reporting business, He's driving his family home when a pickup truck begins tailgating them. Suddenly two men jump out from the pickup and pull guns on Jason, demanding the car. A horrific flash of violence changes his life forever. Later that awful night, Jason and his family receive a visit from the FBI. The agents tell them that the carjackers were members of a dangerous drug trafficking organization, and Jason and his family are now in their crosshairs. The agents advise the Bennett's to enter the witness protection program right away, as in that night, and they have no choice but to agree. So taken from all they know, trapped in an unfamiliar life, the Bennett's begin to fall apart at the seams. And then Jason learns a shocking truth and realizes he has to take matters into his own hands. And he has got to be the one that's going to make sure that the family's protected and what's going on. Lisa's doing a really fun series called Lisa Lie that's happening on Monday nights. It started last Monday night. It's happening for the next three Mondays as well on Facebook um, Live, where she talks about background on the story, much as she did with Eternal. And last week, she talked about the setting, which was really, really important, which is um, Delaware Coast and what happens like in that area and why she chose to write the book there. So this is going to be a spring preview giveaway title. It's a bets on, and it's just one romp of a read. Next, we've got The Younger Wife from Sally Hepworth. And read, readers of the site know how much I absolutely love Sally. Also, if you find, follow Sally on Instagram, her daughter Clementine might be one of my favorite children to watch. This girl is spunky and cute, and she just does one fun, more fun thing every single day. Last week, it was cutting her hair. Yes, we all, as we as parents have all know exactly what that looks like, not good. And it's just a tremendously fun. She's great to follow because she does all kinds of interesting things with her readers. Um, she's from Australia. She's coming up to the States to do a tour. If there's any chance you can get to see her, you definitely want to have a chance to meet with Sally. This book's coming on April 5th. So what's going on in it? Heart surgeon at the top of his field, Stephen Aston is getting married again. But first he has to divorce his current wife even though she can no longer speak for herself. Tully and Rachel Aston look upon their father's fiance, Heather, as nothing but an interloper. Heather is younger than both of them. Clearly, she's after the father's money. With their mother in a precarious position, Tully and Rachel are determined to get the truth about their family's secrets. The new wife is closing in and who their father really is. Heather has secrets of her own and will getting to the truth unleash the most dangerous impulses in all of them. So there we've got the younger wife and Sally is, this is like the, the, the tagline under this one is she changes everything. So there you go, Sally Hepworth, the younger wife. Next, we're gonna do some memoirs, biographies and nonfiction. First, we've got In Love, a memoir of love and loss by Amy Bloom, which is from Random House, it's coming out this week or just out this week. 
Amy Bloom began to notice changes in her husband, Brian. Retired early from a job he loved. He withdrew from close friendships. He talked mostly about the past. Suddenly it seemed there was a glass wall between them and their long walks and talks stopped. The world was altered forever when an MRI confirmed that they could no longer ignore that Brian had Alzheimer's disease. Forced to confront the truth of the diagnosis and its impact on the future he had envisioned, Brian was determined to die on his feet, not live on his knees. Supporting each other in their last journey together, Brian and Amy made the unimaginably difficult and painful decision to go to Dignitas, an organization based in Switzerland and empowers a person to end their life with dignity and peace. In this heartbreaking and surprising memoir, Bloom sheds light on the part of life we sh uh, so often shy away from discussing, its ending. And we all know her of the author as both White Houses and Away. And she just does in this book such a good job of describing this beautiful romance between the two of them. And they're just getting on a plane and this plane, she's going to be flying back alone. Um, I've written some, read some stories that she's um, written or some uh, um, interviews she's done about this book. And it's got to be one of the toughest decisions you make. And it's one of those things of what would you do? And I think that people have a lot of that when they think about this book. Next, we've got Easy Beauty, a memoir by Chloe Cooper Jones. And I've had the pleasure of hearing uh, Chloe talk about this book a couple of times. It's coming out on April 5th. So she's in a bar one night in Brooklyn, listening to two men, my friends, discuss whether my life is worth living. And that's really the beginning of the book. They don't understand why she should be allowed to live at this point. It's her bold, revealing account of moving through the world in a body that looks different from most. She's born with a rare congenital condition called sacral angenesis, uh, which affects both her stature and her gait. Her pain is physical, but also there is also the pain of being judged and pitied for her appearance. The way she has been seen or not seen has informed her lens on the world her entire life. But after unexpectedly becoming a mother in violation of unspoken social taboos about the disabled body, she sets off on a journey across the globe, reclaiming the spaces she'd been denied and that she denied herself. And she talks about that night when she was in this bar and she heard these people talking about her and how hurtful it was to hear people that she considered her friends talking about her like that and how she's gone through life since then of what she's learned about herself and what she's learned about other people as well. Next, we've got Time as a Mother by Osha Wong, which is coming out on April 5th. How else do we return to ourselves but to fold? The page, so it points to the, the good part. In this deeply intimate second poetry collection, Ocean searches for life among the aftershocks of his mother's death, embodying the paradox of sitting within grief while being determined to survive beyond it. Shifting through memory and in concert with the themes of his novel, On Earth We Were Briefly Gorgeous, Wong contends, uh, contends with personal loss the meaning of family, and the cost of being the product of an American war in America. At once vivid, brave, and propulsive, poems circle the fragmented lives to find both restoration as well as the epicenter of the break. And now we've got some May titles to look forward to, and oh, is there a lot coming up. We start with The Book Woman's Daughter by Kim Michelle Richardson, which we recently did as a giveaway on the site, which was one of the most entered giveaways that we've had. People are clearly looking forward to this uh, book. We had interviewed Kim Michelle about the book, uh, the book Woman of uh, Troublesome Creek last year. We're gonna get her back for an interview about the book woman's daughter. It's on sale on May 3rd. In the ruggedness of this beautiful Kentucky mountains, Honey Lovett has always known that the old ways can make hard life harder. As a daughter of the famed blue skin, Troublesome Creek pack horse librarian, Honey and her family have been hiding from the law all their lives. When her mother and father are imprisoned, Honey realizes she must fight to stay free. Picking up her mother's old pack horse library route, Honey begins to deliver books to the remote hollers of Appalachia. Um, Honey is looking to prove that she doesn't need anyone telling her how to survive, but the route can be treacherous and some folks aren't as keen to let a woman pave her way. Next, we've got Mary Kay Andrews, The Home Wreckers. And this is coming on May 3rd. Hattie Cavanaugh went to work restoring houses for Cavanaugh and Son Restorations at 18, married the boss's son at 20 and became a widow at 25. When Hattie falls head over heels for a money pit of a house, she's determined to make it work. 
but disaster after disaster occurs and her dream might cost Kavanaugh and son their livelihood. Hattie needs money and she needs it fast. When a slick Hollywood producer shows up in her hometown of Savannah, Georgia, she gets a once in a lifetime opportunity star in a beach house renovation reality show called The Home Wreckers, cast against a male lead who may be a love interest or the ultimate antagonist. Soon there's more at stake than bad pipes and dry rot. During the demolition, evidence comes to light that points to a mysterious disappearance of a young wife and mother years before. So there we've got The Home Wreckers. Really fun when Mary Kay does a book that's got what we call house porn in it, where she's doing things with the house, because this woman, if you follow her on either Facebook or Instagram, is constantly redecorating. She can find the littlest thing for like $5, $10 and make it look fabulous in her home. So follow her if you're looking for some really great tips on decorating and what to do. And as she calls it, junking. Next, we've got Magic Season, A Sun Story by Wade Rouse. And many of you may know, not know Wade Rouse's name, but you know Viola Shipman because he has written so many of the books under the pen name of Viola Shipman in homage to his grandmother. And this is a very, very different book for Wade. It's a memoir. And it's going to be probably the um, most deep to his heart kind of a book because he's really writing about, well, let me get into it. Before his such a success in public relations, his loving marriage, and his storied writing career, Wade Rouse was simply Ted Rouse's son. A queer kid in a conservative Ozarks community, Wade struggled to garner his father's approval and find his voice. For his part, Ted was a hard-lined engineer, offering little emotional support or encouragement. But when Wade and Ted had one thing in common, an undying love for the St. Louis Cardinals. For decades, baseball offered Wade and his father a shared vocabulary, a way to stay in touch, connect, and express their emotions. But when his father's health takes a turn for the worse, Wade returns to Southwest Missouri to share one final season with his father. As the cards race towards a dramatic pennant, uh, race, Wade and his father begin to open up in ways they never thought possible. Together, inning by inning through their own magic season, they'll more move towards forgiveness, reconciliation and peace. And the book is structured that way. The book is structured that way that it's going to move them through inning by inning of what happens. I've, I've heard nothing but a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous feedback on it. Jenny Lawson said, this is honest, authentic, heartbreaking and healing. So new book coming from Wade Rouse. First time for um, nonfiction from him in a very long time. Next, we've got The Lioness coming from Chris Bajalian on May 10th. It's Tanzania in 1964, when A-list actress Katie Barstow and her new husband, David Hill, decide to bring their Hollywood friends to the Serengeti for their honeymoon, they envision paradise. Their glamorous guests expect, expect civilized adventure, fresh ice from the kerosene-powered ice maker, dinners of cooked gazelle meat, and plenty of stories to tell over lunch back on Rodeo Drive. Katie and her glittering entourage do not expect as this, a kidnapping gone wrong, their guides bleeding out in the dirt, and a team of Russian mercenaries herding their hostages into Land Rovers, guns to their heads. As the powerful sun gives way to night, the gunmen shove them into abandoned huts, and Katie prays for a simple thing, to see the sun rise one more time. It's got a pretty packed, um, action-packed book in The Lioness from Chris Bazalian. Next, we've got that summer place. This is coming from Jennifer Weiner. This is the third in a trilogy that she's been writing. They're all set up in the um, up on the Cape. So when 22 year old stepdaughter announces her engagement to her pandemic boyfriend, Sarah Danhauser is, is shocked. Has strong Ruby has already set a date and spoken to her a beloved Safra, um, Sarah's mother, Veronica, about having the wedding at the family's beach house in Cape Cod. Veronica is thrilled to be bringing the family together one last time before putting the big house on the market. As the wedding date approaches, Ruby finds herself grappling with the wounds left by her mother who walked out when she was just a baby. Veronica ends up facing unexpected news and must revisit the choices she made long ago. And Sarah's twin brother, Sam, is recovering from a terrible loss and confronting big questions about who he is. Sarah's husband, Eli, who has been inexplicably distant during the pandemic, confronts the consequences of a long ago lapse from his typical good guy behavior. And Sarah faces the alluring reappearance of someone from her past and a life that could have been. So there we've got the summer place. Just let's dip our toes in the water. Next, we've got Take Your Breath Away by Linwood Barclay. I haven't read this yet. 
But I think I told them, I think the turquoise on the cover is an homage to me. We'll just take it that way. All right. So here we've got one weekend, Andrew Mason was on a fishing trip. His wife, Bree, vanished without a trace. Most everyone assumed Andy had gotten away with murder, but the police could never build a strong case against him. Andy drank too much to numb the pain and became a pariah in the place he once called home. Now, six years later, Andy's finally put his life back together, sold the house that he once shared with Bree and moved away. To tell the truth, he wasn't here to say it to hear. The old place was raised and a new house built on the site. So he settled down with his new partner, Jane, and life is good. But Andy's peaceful world is about to shatter because one day a woman shows up at his old house address screaming, where's my house? What happened to my house? And then just as suddenly as she appeared, the woman who bears a striking resemblance to Bree is gone. Police are notified and old questions and dark suspicions resurface. So we've got a missing woman, a husband suspected, and the truth will take your breath away. So there you go, coming from Linwood. Next, we've got This Time Tomorrow by Emma Straub coming on May 17th. Told you folks, May is going to be a big month. On the eve of her 40th birthday, Alice's life isn't terrible. She likes her job, even if it isn't exactly the one she expected. She's happy with her apartment, her romantic status, and her independence, and she adores her lifelong best friend. But her father's ailing, and it feels as if something's missing. When she wakes up the next morning, she finds herself back in 1996, reliving her 16th birthday. But it isn't just her adolescent body that shocks her or seeing her high school crush. It's her dad, the vital, charming, 40-something version of her father with whom she's reunited. Now armed with a new perspective on her own life and his, some past events take on new meaning. Is there anything she would change if she could? So we've got This Time Tomorrow from Emma Straub, another terrific cover. So we've got Meant to Be by Emily Giffen. The Kingsley family is beloved for their military heroics and political service. In 1967, after Joseph S. Kingsley Jr. is killed in a tragic accident, his charismatic son inherits the weight of their legacy. But despite his best intentions, Joe Three has trouble meeting the expectations of a nation, as well as those his exacting mother, Dottie. Meanwhile, no one ever expected anything of Kate Cooper. She too grew up fatherless, and after her mother marries an abusive man, she's forced to fend for herself. After being discovered by a model scout at age 16, Kate decides her looks may be her only ticket out of the cycle of disappointment that her mother has always inhabited. Before too long, her face is a magazine on billboards. It feels like a fraud, faking in a world to which she never really truly belonged. And Joe and Kate unexpectedly cross paths one afternoon. Their connection is instant and intense. But can the relationship survive the glare of the spotlight and the so-called Kingsley curse? So it's meant to be a 31st. So we're also going to talk about some notable paperbacks. I'm going to have to move something. Hold on just one second. Give me one second. Um, some notable paperbacks that are coming. Oops, hold on. I was going to hit myself in March. And each one of these, we have actually interviewed the author. And I say this because if any of you are looking for books to do with your book group, there's something to keep in mind that these books are available in paperback right now. But we also have an interview that we did with the author um, a while back. So we've got Lauren Willig's Band of Sisters, Sally Hepworth, The Good Sister, Janice Kelslin uh, Charles, The Paris Library, Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. Hollywood Park by Mikhail Joulet, and The Husbands by Chandler Baker. And this month on Reading Group Guides, the giveaway book for if you tell us what your book group is reading, your group can win 12 copies of the Paris Library for your group. And we're trying to put together something else interesting to do with Janet as well. So just know the Paris Library, um, I believe Tom can confirm this for me. I believe it's going up today on the site. I'll be up for four weeks. Remember, tell us what your group is reading this month. Unless you're reading the Paris Library, don't write that book down. You're telling us what your group is reading. And then you can win three. Three groups will win 12 copies for the group. And we've got some early bets on selections. These are my early ones so far. They're eight, Olga Dies Dreaming, The Last House on the Street, The Maid, Greenwich Park, The Overnight Guest, Black Cake, The Other Family, The Cage. And I have three more that will be going up on Friday. Yes, I will be typing my little fingers off just for you. Next, we've got the most recent interviews that we've done. And we've done, Alison Bataki just went up yesterday talking about the magnificent lives of um, Marjorie Post. I want you to know that we both have grape nut cereal 
out just for you guys because Grape Nuts, remember, was part of the post fortune. So we made sure we each had our cereal um, boxes with us when we spoke. Got um, my interview with Jacqueline Michard about The Good Son. She talks about that first couple of lines in the book, how long she worked on those and how they drove the rest of the story and how she knew them instantly. Black Cake, which is by uh, Charmaine. Um, oh gosh, I'm really spicing last names right now. I'm doing really badly. I have to have Tom jump in here. Um, Charmaine Wilkerson, um, absolutely a terrific book. She writes usually things in scenes. So when she thinks, when she started writing this book, she just had little scenes of, of coming down on paper. And then the story came together when someone asked her for a recipe for her um, mother's black cake that her mother had made, uh, which is a typical, typical Caribbean um, uh, dessert. And then from there, she started to build a story around just those two things. And it's brilliantly done. Um, the Cage by Bonnie Kistler is absolutely terrific. The Cage is actually an elevator. And what happens is two women get in the elevator, the elevator stops, all of a sudden they, they have to be rescued. By the time they get down to the lobby, one of the women is dead, the other one's alive. What happened? Was it suicide? Was it murder? What really happened in that elevator that day? So, and now I'm gonna have to touch someplace else. Hold on a second. Austin teaches me these things, it's so good. Next we've got um, for spring preview, these are the contest um, titles. We've already done the Catch and Joan coming up our Master Craftsman, Summer at the Cape, and what happened to the Bennets. And we've, once again, we're running um, a feature about in case you missed them in a look ahead. There are two books that are out already by Taryn Fisher. It's The Wives and The Wrong Family. And upcoming is An Honest Lie. So these are books that you're one, we're thinking about, uh, take a look at the back list and see if it interests you in reading the um, author's front list. And I know that, you know, that's what happened to me when I was reading Kimberly Bell's book. For our next Book of Chino live event, book group event is going to be on Wednesday, March 23rd at 8 p.m. Where Lisa C. is going to be joining us and she's going to be discussing On Gold Mountain. On Gold Mountain is nonfiction. It's her first book that she wrote and it's the story of her family, um, 100 years of their coming to America, where her um, great, great, great grandfather, I believe it is, um, came to work on the Transcontinental Railroad and how they settled and what happened to the Asian community in the Los Angeles area. So often we only think of this happening up in the San Francisco area. And Lisa, yes, who is part Chinese, even though, as she says, she's the only one in her family doesn't look like that when they get together for, uh, for occasions. But she's going to be talking about this book on Gold Mountain, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, our next Bucuccino live event, which have books from April 12th till May 3rd and a peak ahead of June, will be on Wednesday, April 13th at two o'clock in the afternoon. And sign up will be available on Book Reporter later today. We will also be sending out the link to sign up to anybody who was at today's event live. And um, we will also get the video out later this week. Thanks for everyone for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you next time on Bucuccino Live.